high school dance or high school football game. Tennis was a big part of our life. Our social life was at the tennis club. Wake up every morning and I was like, what am I going to do today to get better? Remarkable. Winning became his obsession. You're going to see a lot more of this young man. I think it was a fear of losing that he scared the crap out of me. He couldn't be stopped, not by tragedy. After that loss, it was hard for him to get motivated to play again. Not by the press. At the height of Pete's game, the media really decided that Andre was the exciting guy and Pete was the boring guy. Pete, if you're watching, I'm coming. <laughs> All right. It definitely really pissed me off. He was an into setting trends. Well, he's very aware of his place in history. He was into setting records. <laughs> I really felt vindicated, like I just shoved up everyone's ass. This is Pete Sampras. Beyond the glory. Absolutely outstanding. Unbelievable. strode onto center court of the 2002 U.S. Open final with a chip on his shoulder. And Sampras blasts in his seventh ace. 2002, you know, people thought I was pretty much washed up and throw me away. The 17th seed, Pete Sampras, that sounds, that sounds bizarre to me to say 17th seed. The two years leading up to 2002 where he hadn't won a major was really a, a kind of tumultuous emotional ride for him because he hadn't won. He was fed up of being told it was time to retire. Still playing great tennis, uh, but not at the level that, uh, that we're used to seeing him at. He seemed to kind of be losing kind of his drive and his focus a little bit. I thought that was it for Pete. I didn't think there was any way that he was going to win the U.S. Open. I believe that I was still the man to beat. I walked out there expecting to win every match. Critics said at 31, he was too old, too slow, and since his marriage to actress Bridget Wilson, too soft. He's worked so hard throughout his entire career. I wasn't particularly crazy about the way everyone was so quick to write it off. It definitely really pissed me off. Served notice to Andre Agassi and the rest of the world. He was back. I just wanted to win another major and just believed I could. Suddenly the juice is back on the serve. Pretty much the whole match was the best I, I probably have ever played. Pete demanded respect and the audience gave it to him. And with final match point, Pete defeated Andre and his critics. During his 14th Grand Slam, breaking his own record. I had the last word, and that feels and that feels great. I mean, I really felt vindicated, like I just shoved up everyone's ass. Take your bows, Pete Sampras. That's topped himself. Pete grew up in Southern California's Palos Verdes, one of four children. Pete and his older sister Stella started playing serious tennis at a young age. Even from the beginning, because of his quickness, his hands, his, he could hit shots that he was even surprised he could hit. Pete and Stella enrolled at the Jack Kramer Tennis Club. It got to a point where Pete and Stella, especially Pete, sh started to show some, you know, some promise there. Enter Dr. Pete Fisher, a pediatrician and amateur tennis coach. He saw this athlete and he saw that I had this natural ability and when I was 
you know, eight to 16, which I think are very huge years for me. For any athlete is getting that right technique and, and being taught the right fundamentals, and that's what he did. Together they studied 16 millimeter films of Australian tennis great Rod Laver. He would become Pete's role model. Pete was always competing against people three, four years older than him. He'd be this little kid walking on the court playing against some guy that's a foot and a half taller than him. And Pete would just, you know, smoke him. Tennis moved front and center in Pete and Stella's lives. Bobby, let's go. Bobby. My adolescence was pretty much from school to the tennis court to playing junior tournaments on the weekends. Never went to a, a high school dance or high school football game. Most of our tennis tournaments were on weekends, Saturday and Sunday, so we really couldn't go out on a Friday night or a Saturday night. In their free time, they challenged each other. In the beginning, being older, being two years older, I did beat him. He was beating me when I was probably 10, 11. He thinks he started beating me when he was younger, when he was 13. I was probably 13, 12, 13, where I started start beating her. I think he started beating me when he was 15, and I was 17. Are you kidding me? I was pro at 16. No, no, no. Um, I think she has the numbers wrong. Pete's commitment to tennis put a strain on the family budget. It was a big sacrifice for my family. I mean, financially, um, it was taxing. My mom is amazing. She, you know, cut out coupons. She just made the money, you know, stretch. At 16, Pete turned pro. He dropped out of high school at 17. We never had any doubts for him to leave high school. It was just a matter of when he was going to make that jump. We both turned pro at Indian Wells. That was our first tournament as a professional. He was 16, I was 17. I mean, we really had no idea what we were getting into. Who are you? I never really worried about it. I never felt like I was making a big mistake. I never felt like um, if I didn't, I just assumed that I was going to make it. Pete left home and moved to Florida. Turning pro also meant becoming an adult. I want to be my own man. I want to take care of myself, make my own decisions, some good, some bad. <laughs> I definitely missed him, and I know he missed being home. So I think that's the biggest challenge for him was just being away from home for so long. His brother Gus traveled with him from city to city, tournament to tournament. Being away from our family for long stretches were, were tough. I mean, we'd be gone for three months or so and really wanted to get home. It was one of these young Americans trying to break through. He was just a skinny little guy, but very, very fluid and really bad teeth. Toward the latter stages of our junior career, I beat him pretty much uh, almost, almost every time. Pete played in the shadows of his peers. Chang won the French Open at 17. Higher rank Courier and Agassi were already generating a buzz. He really went onto the tour with very little expectations in the early years. I think he still thought that he was in development. Pete uh, mentally maybe wasn't as strong as, as maybe some of the other players. It took a little while for me to get a little bigger and stronger and more fit and just to learn how to play out there. And it just all came together at the right time. The right time was just after Pete's 19th birthday, the 1990 U.S. Open. After thundering through the opening rounds, Pete had to square off against the legends of the game. First up, Yvonne Lendl. When I stepped on the court with Lendl, I was like, I've seen Yvonne play for 10 years and grew up watching him and looking up to him. Next up, tennis icon John McEnroe. Then Macro, same situation. Grew up kind of idolizing him also. It didn't seem to matter. Facing serves, clocking in at 120 mile per hour. McEnroe fell. We were on pins and needles watching every match, and he was beating Landoli, beat McEnroe, and we were just in amazement. 
then, only Agassi stood in his way. A lucky break for Pete was in the final, he played someone that he was familiar with and he had confidence against in Andre Agassi. He didn't fear Andre. Very love, just like that. With no answer to Pete's 13th ace of the match. Macro did that too. He sort of looked at him like, who is this masked man? Agassi fell in three straight sets. It was just a fairy tale type of, of story. I mean, I didn't expect it. No one expected it. But in 1990, Pete Sampras became the youngest man to win the U.S. Open Singles Championship. We were crying and just so excited for him and just really couldn't believe it. It was kind of a fairy tale. I mean, we were kind of going, is this real? Did he just win the U.S. Open? Pete Sampras, you are the youngest person to ever win the United States Men's Championship. just got hot for those four days and boom I was holding up the trophy I just wasn't ready I just turned 19 and to be kind of put in that league is can be a little bit overwhelming people are waking up this morning and wondering what is Pete Sampras doing US Open champion and it's gonna take me a while to you know to settle this victory in the big question mark for all of us, I think, was, okay, now, how is this kid going to respond to pressure because he's never had any before? Sampras had become the youngest male singles champion in U.S. Open history. But with success came the harsh reality of celebrity. It was all of a sudden recognized around the world, just an instant pressure on me to do well. And knowing deep down that I wasn't quite good enough at that stage to win another major. All of a sudden, he closes his eyes, the tournament's over, he's holding the trophy, the lights are flashing, and, and David Letterman wants to see him. He was a 19-year-old kid who came from a you know, middle-class, very close-knit family. He was not bred to be a superstar. At first, it was like, I just want to be left alone here in a corner and practice. I wasn't trained for it, wasn't used to it. Pretty shy guy. You know, I just kind of was a tennis player and wasn't prepared for all the media attention. Of American men's tennis very securely in the hands of Pete Sampras. Pete began to question his abilities. All of a sudden, you have a bullseye on your chest. I worried about it, I stressed out about it, and my game wasn't ready. I just was not ready for that to happen. You go from being the up and coming to the player to, to the player that has already arrived. People were gunning, gunning after him now. He struggled a bit those couple years. I wasn't playing well after that US Open win. I just wasn't, wasn't having a fun time. It was just different. But two years after shocking the world, Pete was poised to win again. In the semifinal of the 1992 U.S. Open, he sent Courier packing. He faced Stefan Edberg in the final. A victory was within reach. But late in the match, Pete wilted. Of course, said I kind of packed it in, to be honest with you. Because I figured it was good enough. I was happy with that. Congratulations, that's runner-up. It was a decision he regretted and a lesson he would never forget. That loss changed my career. I would not be sitting here with 14 majors if I, if I didn't lose that match. I don't think he ever wanted to have that feeling again. And I think that was a, a huge turning point for him because he was so disgusted. Disgusted with himself and how he performed. To that point, I didn't hate to lose. You know, I was okay with losing. But that loss, it really bothered me. It bothered me that I gave in like that and that I was being a bit of a wuss about it. I didn't fight hard enough. And I think that always pissed me off and it was like, that just changed everything. It, it just changed everything after that. Pete hired a new coach, Tim Gullickson. 
Tim just thought the world of Pete and believed in him. And that's what Pete needed at that time. He did very well coming from a little town of Wisconsin to being one of the you know, better players in the world. And here I was with a ton of talent, but just didn't you know, work hard or didn't, didn't have that attitude that he had. One of the first things that Tim said to him was, there is no reason on days where you're not hitting the ball well that you don't just figure out a way to win. So take that little white collar off, put your blue collar on, and go to work in those days. Gullickson's first task, the grass courts of Wimbledon. I just had a negative attitude when I got out there on grass, and he didn't buy it. He got a great serve, great volume, a great athlete. You should be able to play well on grass. It's only the fourth time in 46 years, an All-American final. In 93, Pete walked onto the Wimbledon grass with a new attitude. He was pitted against Courier in the final. There was no more nonchalance. He was very much all business. Final Wimbledon is the biggest match in, in, in tennis, in my opinion. It's the Super Bowl, it's the World Series. Ooh. He couldn't sit down in the locker room beforehand. He was visibly a lot more nervous than I was. And I thought that was a good thing for me. And I remember not only was it the Wimbledon final, but it was against Jim. I mean, we stayed together in Florida. We practiced together. We played doubles together. When you're competing for the biggest prizes, the things that you've dreamed of since you're a child, and the person who stands between it is a friend, that friendship goes out the window very quickly. Whoop. There's that running forehand. He served like a baseball pitcher that day. kind of dug deep in it. It was a close match. I remember it was came down to the to the fourth set breaker. Still match point. With Gullickson behind him, Pete conquered Wimbledon. And here's the champion, Pete Sampras. One must wonder how many more times might we see this scene. From then on, everything just got a little easier, and I just belonged, and I felt like I expected to win majors, and that was, uh, that was a huge turning point for me. Pete became consumed with winning. It got to a point where I had to win, you know, to feel good. But Pete's strength would be tested when he faced tragedy. I just lost my composure for about five, ten minutes. I just started bawling, and then just couldn't kind of... It was weird. Confident, Pete returned to the U.S. Open in 1993. He breezed through the finals, beating Cedric Piolin in three straight sets. I, I felt like I belonged. I became a great player that year. Uh, before, I was a good player that played great, but I really felt like that 93 was a year that I was going to be here for a while. I wasn't just going to come and win the Open and leave. I was going to be around for years. With Gullickson at his side, Pete racked up Grand Slam titles and climbed the ranks to number one in 93. I felt like I belonged. I was more prepared. I was secure about everything. I just felt like this is my direction. I'm going to win a ton of majors. We got to be very close. It's almost like a marriage. It's that that intense, that close. You kind of lose together and win together, and you kind of go through all the emotions of, of being on the road. Tim and Pete were best friends. All I can do is fun. Pete was very, very close with Tim. 
They played golf together. They played cards together. They ate every meal together. They did everything together. I think Tim had such a great personality that he helped bring Pete out. Pete was very shy. Tim really helped loosen Pete up a little bit and, and bring Pete out as a person. There's some emotion for Pete said. Yeah, wanting to play with the crowd. Still ranked number one, the 95 Australian Open was supposed to be a gimme for Pete. But as he prepared for an early match, and collapsed. He was taking my rackets and came back, and he just didn't look right, looked real pale. And thank God his brother was there, and before I walk out there, he, uh, he faints. You know, the, the doctor down there gave me the bad news that, you know, there's four spots on Tim's brain, and they could, could be tumors. I kind of kept it all together and was, was just trying to go out and play well and win, so maybe he would feel, make him feel a little bit better. Pete played Courier in the quarterfinal the day Gullickson was flown back to the U.S. for medical tests. I think I just stored up a lot of emotion seeing them crying and, and I just kind of kept it together because I was playing and I lost the first couple sets. And then one fan just said something to him as he was getting ready to serve. Do it for your coach or do it for Tim. And it broke him. And I'm getting chills talking about it. lost my composure for about five ten minutes I just start um, start bawling and then just couldn't kind of it was weird it was just you know it kind of felt good physically to kind of let it go he couldn't serve he couldn't get to the line at that point so you know I kind of called out to him to try and break the tension He thought I was sort of mocking him, and it turned the anger switch on inside of Pete's Hampers, and which you don't want to do that. Pete Sampras has a rare brain tumor. After suffering his second stroke in recent months, Alexson is home in Illinois now. Back in the States, doctors confirmed that Gullickson was suffering from brain cancer. It was hard to see him not be himself as he got worse. One of the last times I might have saw him, he, a friend of he, uh, dropped me off at, at the airport. I got on, on, uh, on the plane, I just, kind of lost it for a minute just like I saw him drive away and I just like you know he's you know I'm not sure I'll ever see him again. Gullickson lost his fight against cancer on May 3rd 1996. I've never been um, to a funeral I've never had anyone close around me die. He spoke a little bit at Tim's funeral and I don't, I don't think he could finish. Uh, he couldn't finish because uh, you know Tim meant that much to him. He actually put his first Wimbledon trophy in the casket. And he, uh, he said that Tim really made him the champion that he was, so.
think at that time he realized that uh, tennis is not his life. There's more to life than tennis. Your life kind of goes on. I mean, I think those same things that you are, you are. I mean, I still wanted to be the best player in the world. I still wanted to win majors and do it for, for him. That month, Pete entered the French Open on a mission. It was the one major tournament that had eluded him. The emotion uh, is, a, is a great drug in a way. I mean, it kind of can get you going, it can inspire you. And it um, definitely inspired me for those two weeks. You know, I really thought I was going to win it. I really did. Pete was eliminated in the semifinal. It was his best finish at the French. The loss ended a turbulent year, one where he could not hide his emotions from the public eye. But to the media, he still remained boring Pete. We live in a day and age where you can't just be a great football player, tennis player, whatever. You need to be more. You need to be outspoken. You need to say controversial things. You need to act like a lunatic. so easy to so many people that they couldn't appreciate exactly what was going on. We don't grasp how difficult and how many hours and hundreds of hours and millions of tennis balls were hit to achieve that. No longer impressed with his ability to win, the media dubbed Pete boring. Boring Pete. That was really hard because he was doing so well. He was putting all his energy into playing and winning, but the people weren't satisfied. They did want someone flashier. He played in the wrong era. Pete's a Joe DiMaggio for tennis. He's a guy who always believed in letting his racket do the talking for him and was miffed by the fact that as loud as his racket spoke, it was enough for today's soundbite MTV media. To put that pressure on me, I think, is the biggest load of crap I've ever heard. You know, to tell me I need to, 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 make, to make my job easier, I want you to act a certain way. Instead of writing about your tennis, which I don't understand, I'll, I want to, you know, act like a lunatic out there. The top two Americans have shared the spotlight over the years. Agassi has Despite the his lesser game, the more flamboyant Andre Agassi became the media favorite. For every Sampras, you need an Agassi. I think that's ultimately what sells the sport, is that you need some contrast. Cashing in on Andre's appeal, an advertiser asked Pete to make a cameo in an Agassi commercial. I didn't do it. I was insulted and a little bit hurt by it, but, uh, you know, I, I got over it quick. Pete refused to change. He made plenty of money. He knows he could have made a lot more if he was a different person, but that may have affected his results. The way I was raised, I never wanted to embarrass my family and just not act well out there. And I just, I would never do that. When parents come to me and say, you're a great role model for my kid, that means more to me than any Sports Illustrated cover. When you win and you dominate the way I did for a while, you're gonna get your your covers of Sports Illustrated, you're gonna get your, your respect. Pete felt his demeanor gave him an edge. No one knew what I was thinking. I mean, I like playing guys that show emotion. You know, when they're PO'd or something, I feel like I really got them. If you're on the other side and all you see is our aces, he's serving really well. That is boring to me. If someone's acing me left and right, that to me is boring. <laughs> because he wasn't emotionally volatile or really flamboyant with his emotions, people didn't realize how much heart he had, you know, how much he wanted to win. His desire to win was insatiable. Sometimes it meant taking his body to the breaking point. At the 1995 Davis Cup, Pete battled through a grueling five-set match. He fought through exhaustion to win. But then collapsed. He is down. 
It was a little scary. I've never had that sensation. At the last point, I, my whole body cramped up, my legs, and I just went down. Painful. He's going to be three for three hours, 39 minutes. Sampras is out. He didn't even shake hands with Chernikov. Pete's grit and determination were again on display in the quarterfinal of the 1996 U.S. Open. In a fifth set tiebreaker against Alex Karecha, Pete got sick on the court. Just felt a little empty, a little hungry, and, and just getting a little tired. I felt like I could hit a few shots and maybe find some sort of way to win and hang in there. Yet he came back to save match point and uncorked a second serve ace at 7-7 to win. He's the strongest willed athlete I've ever seen. He loved to win. I don't think he wanted anyone to take his spot. That was really what drove him. He wanted to be number one. Pete was poised to break Roy Emerson's Grand Slam record at the 1999 U.S. Open. I was winning and I was oozing with confidence. But an injury interfered with his plans. Apparently he went for like a return real quick and I just felt like this is kind of sharp pain in my back. He was forced to withdraw from the tournament with a herniated disc. I was very disappointed. I felt like I was going to win it. I really did. So it was a serious injury. I couldn't do anything for a couple months. Just pretty much lay on the couch and lay in bed. What happened next? would change Pete's life. If I didn't hurt my back, I would not have met my wife. The first date, I was honestly too nervous to really remember much of it. I came home and my sister was like, how was it? And I was like, good, I think. It took six months for Pete to recover. For the first time since he was seven, he was unable to pick up a racket. After he had to pull out of the U.S. Open, I think that moment gave him an opportunity to live his life outside of tennis. While recuperating, he saw the film Love Stinks, featuring actress Bridget Wilson. I was like, wow, this girl's, she's a good-looking girl. And I was with a friend of mine. I sarcastically said, you know, give me her number or something like that. And he called me the next day with her number. And I'm like, immediately got nervous and just like, okay, am I really gonna call this girl? Where it came into play for me was my publicist, Deb, calling me up saying, hey, there's this guy and he's really nice and I think you should go, you know? Bridget didn't know very much about Pete. I was asking questions, you know, like, is he taller than me? What's he look like? I, I left a message that said, uh, this Pete Sampras was wondering, you know, if you wanna, I don't even know what I said, if you wanna, get some dinner, get a drink, just call me back. And a drink turned into dinner, and we ended up chatting for many hours, and then sort of hung out every day since. <laughs> Pete and Bridget were engaged in nine months and married within the year. With Bridget in his corner, he now focused on breaking the Grand Slam record at Wimbledon 2000. I was struggling a little bit during that year, but I felt like I can break the record here. And this time, he wanted his parents in the stands. They've never seen Wimbledon, and Wimbledon's been a big part of my tennis, my life. I've always invited them to come, and they've always said, oh, you're doing fine, we'll stay here, we'll jinx you, whatever. And so I invited them again. Win or lose, I'm like, I want them there. It's not like it's easy to watch your son or daughter play one of the biggest matches of their life and have so much on it. My sisters convinced them to go. So they flew in and they said two things, good luck, and put me in a seat that's not where the cameras are. It was a tough match. He was injured, he couldn't practice, he wasn't hitting on the off days. He didn't practice the entire two weeks because he was in too much pain. It was the worst two weeks of my career. It really was. I mean, it was the hardest thing I had to get through. I mean, at one point I was gonna quit. I was like, I can't, I mean, I'm, I'm going home or I'm, I'm dealing with, I can't even walk in my off days. But Pete was too close to the Grand Slam record to go home. In the final, Pete lost a first set tiebreaker to Patrick Rafter. Oh, Sampras throws another double fault, and that gives the first set to Rafter. Then he was forced into another tiebreaker for the second set. Down 4-1, I felt like it was not gonna happen. It's going to slip away down two sets. I knew if he lost the second set, it was over. Pete hung on. 
From one minute, I think I was going to lose to the next minute. I have a chance to win here. With rain delays, the match dragged on into the night. We resume play. 26 minute. Rain delay and Pete Sampras to serve. At that point, it's just adrenaline and just sucking it up and just not worrying about it, not dealing with it. And um, kind of enjoyed that pain a little bit during the match. Championship points. He's got it. And he's made history. What an evening this is for Pete Sampras. He is now the man who's won the most Grand Slams in the history. His endurance paid off. He defeated Rafter in four sets and captured his record-setting 13th Grand Slam title. Both my sister and I were in tears. First, we didn't know what he was doing, and then when we saw that he was looking for my parents, our hearts just melted. It's asking where his parents are. It's just another fairy tale for Pete and for our family. This is more than playing a tennis match. This is about having the people there that really have kind of really been behind me. And so that was, it always kind of chokes me up a little bit when, when I think of them in that moment. It was one of the best moments of my life. I watched his whole body do what I was feeling sitting up there because it was just this, his arms were way up in the air and then just collapse. And I just felt that, oh, finally you can just breathe and relax. Pete had surpassed the legends of the game, even his old childhood idol, Rod Laver. It meant that everything that I gave up was worth it to break this record and to do it at Wimbledon. And I feel like I worked harder than anyone, I feel like I wanted it more than anyone and I feel like I deserve to be on that stage at that moment. But the applause soon faded. Pete lost the US Open that year, and in 2001, he was knocked out of Wimbledon for the first time in five years. Once you set that bar so high, you only make news when you lose. It's starting to become painful for Sampras. When his losses stretched into a 33 tournament drought, whispers that he had lost it began to dog him. There was all different reasons that came into play, and he's too old, and he's too slow, and he doesn't care as much. And I think the majority of that was wrong. I speculated that, actually, no, I knew. Pete wasn't working. I think I was tired. You know, I was, I was spent. An accumulation of the record and just of how hard I was going at it, I think, took its toll on me. I just didn't didn't want it as much. I just it was too much too much of a grind. But when the media blamed Bridget, Pete snapped. I think he felt you can attack me, you can attack my game, but leave my family out of it. It never feels good to have people talk negative about you. It wasn't her fault. If anything, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. You know, I'm happy. <laughs> you know. I might not be winning every tennis match, but I'm, I'm happy with my life. You can criticize me, but don't criticize my family. It really, really bothered me. I mean, it just pissed me off, flat out. A little bit of a lighter ball. Yes. Pete was advancing to tournament finals. He just wasn't winning. So, he had a huge dream of, I know I still have it in me. I've got to get it back. I want to get it back. And so then, that's when he really got himself going, I can do this one more time. I can do it, and I'm gonna do it. I never had a question in my mind that he could win another slam. Well, I just believed that I, I had the game. You know, I just, I believed that I was still the man to beat. Pete made it to the US Open finals again in 2002. To play Andre in the finals of the US Open, 25,000 people, that was a pretty amazing way to go out. Pete won his 14th Grand Slam, breaking his own record. The 2002 U.S. Open men's singles champion, Pete Sampras. It was a beautiful way for him to end it. With nothing left to prove, Pete took some time to decide what was next. He focused on his home life. On November 21st, 2002, Bridget gave birth to their son, Christian to have this little human being that is completely dependent on him and loves him unconditionally. It's made me respect my parents, that love and that care of someone else. Looking back at like some of the decisions I've made over my life and the bad ones and the good ones, it's like I must have just tore my parents off the shreds. At a 
ceremony held at the 2003 U.S. Open, the site where he won his first major title 13 years earlier, surrounded by family, with his son in his arms, Pete said goodbye to tennis. I'm going to say goodbye for the last time and have a good night. Thank you very much. Well, you might be saying goodbye, but there'll always be a little piece of Pete Sampras here at the USTA National Tennis Center. It just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks there for a minute. It was like, I'm not going to be out here again, and it's hard, but I knew it was time. It's this weird starting over point. So it's exciting and it's intimidating, but it's wonderful. He was a scrawny kid from California, determined to be the best. And in the age of media hype, Pete Sampras quietly became the greatest tennis player in the history of the game. I'm taking care of my boy, trying to be a good father and a good husband. Now I've done everything I wanted to do and more. I ended it on my terms and you know, it's the way I, I want to go out.